Hi, my name is Pamela Coons, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. I'm excited to announce ASCO's new open access journal, JCO Oncology Advances. As the inaugural editor-in-chief, I hope to support JCO Oncology Advances to become the premier platform to bridge the gap between accessible scientific research and clinical care. Stay tuned for more information, including new article types, at ascopubs.org forward slash JCO Oncology Advances. We look forward to seeing your submissions in spring of 2024. This JCO podcast provides observations and commentary on the JCO article entitled High Risk Symptomatic Cardiac Events in Childhood Cancer Survivors by Helena J. Vanderpaul et al. My name is Greg Armstrong, and I am an assistant member in the Department of Epidemiology and Cancer Control at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. My oncologic specialty is long-term survivorship of childhood cancer, and the article is titled High Risk of Symptomatic Cardiac Events in Childhood Cancer Survivors by Helena J. Vanderpaul. More than 80% of children diagnosed with a malignancy will become five-year survivors of their cancer, the majority of whom will survive into adulthood. As a result, the National Cancer Institute's Office of Cancer Survivorship projected that as of 2005, there were 300, over 328,000 survivors of childhood cancer in the United States. Thus, improved survival has led to a new and growing population of adult survivors of childhood cancer that did not exist just a few decades ago. However, increased rates of survival have come with a cost, as there is significant long-term morbidity and mortality for certain high-risk populations of survivors associated with treatment for childhood cancer. Treatment for childhood cancer may include chemotherapeutic agents, such as the anthracycline class of drugs, and or chest-directed radiotherapy. Both have been documented, documented to adversely impact cardiac function in the immediate treatment period, as well as increase the risk for reduced left ventricular function later on in adolescence and young adulthood. Impaired left ventricular systolic and diastolic function, pericardial thickening, premature coronary artery disease, and cardiac valve abnormalities have all been described in survivors of childhood cancer. While longitudinal studies have established that both anthracycline chemotherapy and chest-directed radiotherapy can result in poor cardiac outcome in exposed childhood cancer survivors compared to controls, the trajectory of cardiac function in adulthood has not been clearly defined. Vanderpaul and colleagues However, now report on over 1,300 adult survivors of childhood cancer and identify that the cumulative incidence of symptomatic cardiac events is 12.6% at 30 years from diagnosis among those exposed to both anthracyclines and chest-directed radiotherapy. This means that while still in early to middle adulthood, one in eight of these survivors now has a severe life-threatening cardiac disease. Consistent with other studies, these poor outcomes are associated with, in a dose-response manner with both cumulative dose of anthracyclines and chest-directed radiotherapy. Importantly, the authors identify an exponential increase in risk with increasing cumulative doses of both anthracyclines and chest-directed radiotherapy. The primary contribution of the Vanderpaul study is the enumeration of severe and life-threatening cardiac events, not in childhood, but in early and middle adulthood. The Childhood Cancer Survivor Study recently published self-reported but non-validated cardiac outcomes in this time period. However, with this analysis, Vanderpaul and colleagues provide a study with outcomes abstracted from the medical record and validated by a cardiologist, both of which significantly improve the validity of their findings. Additionally, near complete enumeration of the outcomes for greater than 90% of five-year survivors from their institution reduces the potential for bias from missing data. An additional strength of the current study is the use of well-established criteria for defining severe and life-threatening cardiac events, the common terminology criteria for adverse events developed by the National Cancer Institute. Use of these criteria allow for reproducibility of the study in other populations and comparison of rates across populations. In addition, these criteria reduce the subjectivity inherent in evaluation of mild and moderate cardiac disease by classifying them as grade one and two. Elimination of grade one and two outcomes from the current study provides increased certainty that the authors are not over-reporting cardiac events. This study improves upon previous studies of survivors of childhood cancer which utilized echocardiogram, largely in the first 10 years from diagnosis and treatment, to enumerate subclinical cardiac dysfunction. It is still unclear whether subclinical dysfunction in the first 10 years from treatment predicts subsequent symptomatic heart failure. 
Thus, true symptomatic event rates and cardiac death rates are the ultimate outcomes of importance. Among the limitations of the study is the failure to collect information on traditional cardiovascular risk factors and their impact upon the trajectory of cardiac function in adulthood. This is of particular importance when one considers that increased rates of traditional cardiovascular risk factors, such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, occur in this age group and may further compound the insult on the injured heart. The establishment of increased risk in patients with clustering of cardiovascular risk factors provides a target for future intervention and thus should be investigated. Additionally, the small number of events precludes the ability of the study to evaluate individual outcomes such as ischemia or an infarction or valvular disease within the context of the current study. However, with the ability to provide longitudinal follow-up of this population, the investigators are well positioned to answer these questions in the future. Going forward, a number of key questions remain to be addressed among adult survivors of childhood cancer who received cardiotoxic treatments. Screening this population of cardiomyopathy may allow early detection. However, the efficacy of echocardiography for detection of myopathy has not been established. Further investigation should also consider alternative measures of screening, including evaluation by cardiac MRI. Additionally, early detection prior to symptomatic presentation is optimal. Thus, novel modes of echocardiographic detection, such as the use of myocardial strain analysis and measures of diastolic dysfunction, should be explored. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, interventional trials of medical therapy, such as beta blockers or ACE inhibitors, may delay or, that may delay or reverse the decline in function are essential. In closing, however, the study by Vanderpoel starts us down the path towards a better understanding of the risks that adult survivors of childhood cancer exposed to cardiotoxic therapies face as they age through early and middle adulthood. This concludes the JCO podcast. Thank you for listening. For more original research, editorials, and review articles, please visit us online at jco.org. This production is copyrighted to the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thank you for listening.